We love us some horror flicks here at Reactions, so this year for Halloween, we're coming at you with the historical chemical breakdown of the most crucial element of any scary flick, fake blood. If you're squeamish and hate the sight of blood, turn away. We'll be showing clips from the classics and all the must-see horror chemistry you need. If you want to be in the business of making fake blood, you're going to have to get to know the real thing first. Blood gets its opaque red color from an oxygen-carrying protein called hemoglobin. This protein is made up of these four subsections that are centered around smaller compounds called hemes. Dead smack in the middle of these molecules, you're going to find iron atoms. The hemes bind with oxygen to transport it through the body, and the different bonds change the wavelength of light that it absorbs. Thus, the more oxygen, the brighter the red. Special effects artists have long tried to simulate this coloration with countless methods and varying degrees of success. The first attempt of which started right here, the Grand Gunwalf Theater, a playhouse known for its controversial use of violence and legendary fake blood. Their secretive recipe is believed to be a heated concoction of equal parts carmine and glycerol. Carmine is a common pigment that's derived from cochineal beetles, and glycerol is a sweet-tasting, viscous liquid that's created by breaking down triglyceride fats with water. Together, they make for a pretty gory sight. And by the 1940s, the blood was further enhanced with the addition of methyl cellulose, which acts as a thickening agent. This chemical is very hydrophilic, so in other words, it loves to absorb and hold onto water, which makes for a smooth, disgusting sludge. This stuff is so effective that it's still used today. But the Grand Ginwall's blood was for the stage. The screen, on the other hand, brought totally new challenges to the the table. For example, in the 1960 masterpiece Psycho, Alfred Hitchcock found that realistic looking blood didn't have enough contrast on black and white film to look real, so he famously used chocolate syrup instead. George Romero also used chocolate syrup in The Night of the Living Dead, but this rendition of fake blood only cut it in black and white. Color film offered a whole new palette of issues. In 1962, the godfather of slasher flicks, Herschel Gordon Lewis, was working on his first color gore fest, Blood Feast, about a rabid cannibal food caterer. So obviously he was going to need a safely consumable, red-colored fake blood. His signature recipe mixed red dye into a diarrheal remedy known as kaopectate, which at the time was a mix of clay called kaolinite and pectin. Having a perfect consistency, opacity, and dramatic color, this would be H.G. Lewis's career-spanning splatter. But before Blood Feast, London's Hammer Studios released their first Technicolor horror feature, Terence Fisher's The Curse of Frankenstein, using their industry standard blood recipe, Kensington Gore. Generally speaking, this was a mixture of golden syrup, warm water, food coloring, and cornstarch to adjust opacity. Sugar syrups would become the base of many a fake blood to come, but not without some sticky setbacks. When filming Sam Raimi's 1981 cult classic, The Evil Dead, Bruce Campbell claimed that his fake blood-drenched shirt crystallized under heat and shattered after he tried to dry it up. But he's not the only one. After filming the gymnasium fire scene in Brian De Palma's Carrie, Sissy Spacek also claimed that she was turned into a candy apple using a similar blood recipe. Raimi's recipe was one for the budget filmmaker. You too can do it at home. In a large bowl, pour six pints of clear cheapo corn syrup. For opacity, add one pint of non-dairy creamer. For the rich color, add one pint of red food coloring. And to deepen that red, just one tiny drop of blue food coloring. Stir it up and behold the horror. Corn syrup is also known as a glucose syrup, and it's made by adding an acid or enzyme to corn starch, which splits up long starch chains into individual molecules of glucose sugar. By introducing that corn syrup to heat, the syrup itself would begin to lose viscosity, and at the same time will lose moisture. Then when cooled down afterwards, that lack of moisture makes the syrup harden, which is bad news for the stars. Okay, there's one more iteration of corn syrup-based fake blood that's a bit more chemically complicated than the rest and much, much less edible. Legendary makeup artist Dick Smith invented this industry standard that would eventually work its way into William Friedkin's supernatural, absolutely disturbing film, The Exorcist. This fake blood included a dash of methylparaben, a preservative often found in cosmetics that could extend the blood's shelf life for longer shoots. It also had something called a photographic wetting agent to change the viscosity of the liquid so that it would flow more uniformly. This helped give the syrup the ability to absorb into clothes, making it more physically blood-like. Well, folks, whether it be from restrictions in the medium or budget limitations, filmmakers have always tailored their fake blood to suit their own needs. And for the most part, fake blood has been a sweet situation. And even today, a lot of these recipes are still used on the big screen. From chocolate syrup to candy spacex, the story of fake blood is one about adaptation. And of course, how chemistry makes it all so real. All right, folks, do us a favor and post some of your favorite horror flicks down in the comments. And come on now, we want some of those deep cuts. We're looking to get scared this Halloween. Thumbs up and subscribe on the way out, and we'll see you again soon.